start recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, today, we are going to look a little bit uh, more closely at our particle system code, which we sort of put in. Uh, and actually, it's all working now. Uh, it didn't take us very long, I guess, to put that in there. Um, so that's good and all, but uh, we've got a bunch more work to do. There's a bunch of subtleties there, and there's something I'm really afraid about. Um, and uh, we'll have to kind of talk about it a little bit and figure out what we're going to do about it. Um, it's it's uh, sort of just a, another aspect of the 2D-ness of the way we do things. Uh, so there's a little bit of the uh, of the particle system stuff. I'm, I'm not 100% sure what we're going to do about uh, but you know we've certainly we have options, so it's not uh, it's not the end of the world. But um, we'll talk about that a little bit uh, a little bit as well. So uh, let's just get right into it here. Today is day three thirty nine. Uh, so if you want to follow along at home, you want to use day three hundred thirty eight source code. Um, that's what I'm using today. So let me go ahead and open up our pro. Okay, that's not what I wanted at all. I pushed the wrong file. There it is. Uh, so if we go ahead and run, uh, you can see that we sort of made this little thing that like kicks these little particles off when we, when we sort of hit the ground there. Uh, and that's all fine. Uh, but we have sort of a little bit of a bug. Uh, we haven't quite finished uh, getting this stuff working. Uh, because we need to make sure that when we move uh, these particles uh, move properly uh, with changes in the camera. Um, I like how this map still includes a boost square, but I don't know where it goes. Uh, <laughs> we have this problem of like, uh, I guess we, we have sort of this, uh, the, the thing that creates the world's like, still puts the boost square in, even if there's nowhere to boost to. I have no idea where it was trying to boost to, uh, but that's not great, you know, not a good thing. Uh, anyway, so if we go over to um, the other screen here, when we move across from screen to screen, our particles now like appear to do the right thing. Um, so that's good, right? I mean, they're not, they're not obviously wrong. Um, you know, they're, they, they're somewhat correct. Uh, but what we found yesterday when we sort of slid things down just to see uh, whether they were being placed correctly, it did look like uh, if you really pay close attention to what happens to the particles during the transition, uh, they are not displaced the way that we would expect, right? Uh, so as I kind of hop to the side here, uh, you'll notice that as I move, you can pretty clearly see the particles are, are getting... Um, a lot of slide to them uh, that is not what we would expect. And so I'm not really sure where that slide is coming from. Um, it would be a more understandable slide if it wasn't sinusoidal in nature. That's the part that really weirds me out about it. Uh, you can kind of see here as I move um, that the particles will shift uh, first shift left in their cell uh, and then shift right in their cell uh, which does not make a whole lot of sense. If this were strictly a perspective, uh, like they were getting transformed at the wrong perspective kind of a problem, I would have expected to see a more uh, straightforward displacement problem. Like either they're being displaced more slowly than the ground or more quickly than the ground, but not an apparent like sh sort of um, quicker and then slower, you know, uh, uh, inconsistent, if you will change. Uh, that is not what I would have expected to see. Now, the first thing I'm going to point out here is that in theory, this should have nothing to do with our displacement uh, because the displacement only happens when the camera actually moves. It does not happen uh, when the camera is simply uh, just shifting. Because if you remember the way we implemented this is we shift the camera first, then we actually move the sim region in the center of the camera over, then we shift it. So it's kind of like, it's almost like a glorified screen shake the way we do that so that we can sort of keep this notion of which room we're centered on. And then we just do this kind of displacement uh, for moving the camera there. So what I'm wondering is, I would just like to know if we didn't do the frame displacement at all. So let's say I did frame displacement uh, and I just nullified it. So now we're not adding uh, that frame displacement at all. 
uh, I want to see what actually happens uh, when I go ahead and, and, and shift, right? Um, Uh, so as I move across, so you can see that break line there. You see how like as I come across, it shifts back, right? Um, but you can see that that uh, yeah, it's it, it really does not require the frame displacement. The frame displacement is strictly accounting re um, realigning for that camera shift. Uh, you can see that the particles are shifting separate from that. So it really is something to do with the way that they're getting transformed uh, separate from everything else. So we know that it's not our frame displacement that's to blame there. It's some other uh, element. Um, and the frame displacement seems to be working properly. Uh, so I'd like to go ahead and, and see if I could figure out, uh, figure out what is causing the other problem uh, with the Z there. Now... One thing that's true is we're not setting the Z level properly uh, for our particles. And again, I'm not really sure exactly how we're going to handle that. Um, one thing we could do is just make sure that we actually do sort our particles into Z levels. I'm nervous about doing these extra things to particles because there's a lot of them. Uh, so it makes me a little worried. But, you know, if we were going to do that, it's not particularly hard. Uh, all we would do is say, well, for the transform... Um, we've kind of got the notion of the Z floor, right? And we've got the notion of the Z level. So in theory, we could record those for our particles as well. Um, and if we want to do that, you know, it's not that big of a deal. So if we want to do something like that, then when we were to, uh, would spawn the particles, we would track uh, that information. So, uh, you know, we do for each particle 4x, uh, we would say, you know, what is, uh, and, and this would basically just mirror the render group. Um, meow, 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 meow. Where is my transcript? There it is. Uh, so we've got the floor Z and the chunk Z there, right? Um, and so if we were to store both of those, we wouldn't need to actually store them per particle per se, uh, because we spawn these particles as a batch currently. Uh, so in theory, you know, we've got these four X's here, four X's, four X's, four X's. Uh, we want this particle structure to be aligned, obviously. Um, so the these two being sort of orphaned isn't a great idea. Uh, so we'd probably stick a pad at the end of here so that to make sure everything lines up on a four X boundary. Um, other than that, we're fine. So if you take a look at what's going on here, You can see that all we would need to do is when someone says spawn fire, uh, we just need the floor Z uh, and the chunk Z. Uh, and so, you know, it's, uh, like I said, it's theoretically possible to get this information in here. So let's just go ahead and try it. I don't love it, uh, we're, but, you know, I don't want to uh, prematurely say that we're not going to do it all. Uh, so let's just try it first and we'll see where we land at that point. Uh, so then we can say, all right, in our object transforms as we go, we can set the chunk Z um, and the floor Z uh, to a particular particle's settings. Uh, we can set those here because they'll be the same for each batch of four particles. Uh, that will obviously come from the um, A particle there. Uh, there we go. And uh, if we're going to overwrite that, then probably what we would want to do is we wouldn't want to, um, we would probably want to have our own version here. So I'd probably say like, okay, since we're going to modify it, let's say that we have a transform that equals our transform in it so that we don't break the transform for the people who come after us, which we might do otherwise. Uh, that's mostly that. Uh, let's go ahead and take the address there. Uh, so spawn fire is going to have to get that information. Uh, hopefully we have that information. Um, that would be over here somewhere when we want to spawn these guys. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, we sort of do sort of don't, right? Like uh, we only compute these um, for, uh, for ones we actually know about. 
So while the chunk z uh, is quite easy to compute, uh, the floor z is not so easy to compute. Um, it should be much easier to compute because it should just be a straight value that you can just look up. Uh, and so we could probably get it pretty easily by just doing a multiply uh, based on the chunk z, which of course at that point one might wonder why we don't just pass one value down and the answer is because um, we haven't gotten to that level of cleanliness yet. But um, when we do spawn fire, point being, where is there it is, uh, we have one of these pretty easily which is just the z layer. Um, but we have to figure out how to get the other one because we haven't actually, we only compute that for the levels we can see and we want to spawn fire probably on any level, although maybe that, no, nah, I, I think we do though on any level regardless of whether we can see it. Um, so anyway, uh, when we do the spawn fire, we get the Z layer, we then need um, that, that uh, Flora Z, this guy right here, and I'm going to maybe put these in the opposite order. Okay. Um, so that floor Z, I have to figure out a way to compute, and you can kind of see the way that's been computed up here already, it's, uh, it's called camera relative ground Z, uh, and it's getting computed, uh, this way, right, you can, you can kind of see, it's like, okay, whatever the relative layer index is, uh, you know, I mean, this, this is the computation. So if we bake out that computation, we should be able to just do it wherever we want to, so I'll put it one in there. Uh, temporarily, and then maybe we can systematize that a little bit so it's not such a, you know, uh, hacky sort of cut and pasty sort of thing. So in terms of whatever the relative layer index is, I assume that to get the relative layer index, all we would really have to do uh, is take the entity Z layer, right, um, and subtract it from the camera Z layer. Uh, and I don't know what the camera Z layer is, but I'm assuming we must have had to figure out what that was before at some point, right? Um, somewhere here we must have that information. What is the camera's level value? Anybody know? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's probably zero uh, in... Ah, I know where this is, never mind. Uh, so these are just, these are computing the relative ones, uh, which means it's always just assuming that it's relative to zero being where the camera is. So presumably when we do the entity layer Z stuff, when we compute its relative one, we must have a way of, of uh, figuring that out, right? So we must do it right in here. Uh, so relative layer Z layer, here it is. So it's sim region origin chunk Z, that's what I want. I'm like, I knew it's in here somewhere. There's gotta be a way to compute that, that layer. Uh, all right, so let's take a look um, uh, at how this stuff is working here. Do, do, do. Um, meow, meow, meow. So if I want to know what it is, I just look it up from the sim region and off we go. Uh, so now we're spawning these in theory at the correct floor height. Um, you know, uh, and I, I would highlight the in theory there because we have not actually done anything to verify that that was true. Um, but now we can sort of check to see whether that had any effect whatsoever uh, on, you know, uh, go to the other, go hop, there you go. I don't know why we're now stopping in that space. I guess that's just the way the alignment was. It's weird. Uh, anyway. Uh, so here we go. So it doesn't look like that has any effect on it, right? Like it looks like it still it still gives that really weird like sinusoidal pattern as we go, uh, you know, from left to right. All of those particles still shift, uh, and they don't shift in a in a very predictable way, as far as I can see. 
I don't know. So, yeah. It bugs me a little that I don't have a good idea about why that would be happening. Um, I am interested to know about whether the Z value of these things... Uh, I mean, my feeling is that since the Z values are not going to... Um, since the Z values of the particles are not really related because it's always doing the perspective based on the chunk. I don't understand why, uh, you know, I don't understand why I'm not getting a consistent movement uh, and why there's that sort of slippage back and forth. And so I wish I had more of an inkling as to why that would be, um, why there would be that kind of slippage there. And... One thing I could think of is if it was an off by one frame error, but if it was, I would see jitter. It wouldn't be a smooth, it wouldn't be smooth like it is, right? Um, because when we change the simulation time step, we're still rendering at 60 frames a second. So an off by one frame error would not manifest itself um, as a sort of weird displacement like that that was really consistent it would be like a single frame jitter still always at 60 frames a second of jitter. Um, so I really don't know. I'm at a loss uh, for why that would be transforming the way that it is. Uh, so we'll have to start playing around with something and, uh, and seeing how it goes. Because you can see it really clearly, right? And what's interesting about it is, so I guess here's one th pretty big clue. Uh, at least I think it's a clue. It looks to me uh, like if we watch these particles more carefully, um, that they do they do kind of look like uh, they are separating in parts, right? Like, it does look like different parts of them gets, get moved differently, right? Which does sort of still suggest that there's some kind of weirdness to the perspective there or something odd going on. And again, I'm not really sure what that is. But not all of the particles move the same amount. So do you see here, these particles are moving this way and these are saying stationary, right? And see, here's the weird part, too, where now they start to move back. So I guess I don't have any real strong ideas about that other than it, do, it sure does look like there's some perspective motion going on there of some kind, uh, which I'm not sure why there would be. I'll double check our perspective transform because I would like to see what's going on there. Um, 
But I guess one thing I could try as well um, is let's just zero out the Z component of our particles to see whether it makes a difference, right? Because if I was to set the Z component to zero always, so for example, here is the, the P value. Um, if I'm just to eliminate the P value entirely uh, and then run the code again, in theory, I should now have one where there's no Z component to the particles at all, right? Um, they're, there's, they're just Y, I guess, right? Uh, and I don't even know, did they even have a Z value in the first place? I'm not sure. Because uh, I thought we we didn't actually use Z. So they, their Z values actually should always be zero anyway, right? Zero, zero, zero. Uh, so yeah, even though probably they should be using Z, these, these, this is copied from a particle system, remember when we were just doing tests, they're only moving in Y, right? So there is no perspective to even have them transform at all. You know what I mean? So I'm really not sure how we can get such a, a weird slip and slide there. Uh, and let's take a look uh, at what we're feeding in for the transform then. I wonder if there's something odd about the transform uh, that I should be aware of here. Uh, so. Let's move back here. Uh, so if I were to take a look at that transform, if that is in world mode, update and render particles. Um, so that's using the world transform. And that seems pretty reasonable. Uh, I would like to see for the entities what are they using for a transform? Uh, so if we take a look here, when we build this stuff, hmm. So Interestingly enough, this is not actually what the entities are using for drawing because this code is kind of a little too stringy at this point. Um, in this case, we pass the camera P, so it's actually It's actually subtracting away the camera P as part of for the world offset, and then we're passing that in, and you know we're redoing that calculation, right? So the entity transform also has the, it sort of separated out there, which should yield the same result. Like there's nothing particularly unusual about that, certainly. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So that's a tough one. That's a pretty tough one. And uh, I guess we're going to have to get a little bit more serious here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take an entity and the particles it spawned, and I want to start to start to correlate what is actually getting sent down for their transforms. Because since I, I, I'm like literally have no idea, right? Like I'm looking at this problem and just going, okay, I, from the motion, nothing is jumping out at me as like, oh, well, it's obviously X, right? Uh, and so I don't have anywhere in particular to investigate. So what I wanna try and do is say, well, if I know that two things are wrong, if I know that like the position in, of the end of the, like the, the ground chunks um, and the particles that are on top of them, if I know that those two things are moving relative to each other and I don't think they should be, then what I wanna do is try to take a look at 
what are they sending down to the renderer, right? Because if I look at what they're both sending down to the renderer, I should be able to find a difference somewhere. Uh, and hopefully by look, you know, sort of hunting down that difference, uh, I would be able to go, okay, here, now I can see what the problem is between these two, right? Um, and so here's the, you know, and here's the code get render entity basis P that is the thing that's actually doing the transform for the camera. Uh, and when you look at what happens here, right, uh, you can kind of see the projected, uh, the projection stuff, it's based off a few things, that floor Z setting, um, the, uh, uh, the the z value the z value of the um uh, component itself is not actually used for that it's just used for the computing the y displacement right um the projection is actually coming uh, entirely from just the floor z uh, that's where the distance to pz uh, computation comes in so I don't really know why we would be getting um, why we would be getting that problem. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I just want to take a look at these two things uh, and see what I can see. So what I'm going to try doing is I'm just going to step in. I'm going to kill this. I'm going to step in to see uh, the first time that I spawn a particle. Uh, what I want to do is I just want to back up quickly. Uh, and well, I guess I don't need to back up too quickly here, but floor Z is zero, chunk Z is zero. So that's easy to remember. Um, and all I want to do is I want to look at where this entity that, that, you know, did this morning, where is the entity re uh, getting rendered itself? Like what does its entity transform actually look like by the time we get down, uh, to, uh, when it actually gets used, right? So, uh, we've got... All this stuff here, we're coming down to it here, and here we are with our um, with our transform finally uh, getting put into use right here. So here's the entity transform. Here's it's getting set down. I'm just gonna like select this and cut and paste it. So I'm gonna go into four coder here, um, go into the scratch buffer. Here's my data in the scratch buffer. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a breakpoint. So when we actually go to render those particles, I'm going to go ahead and uh, set a breakpoint when we go to render the first particle uh, and see what its transform is because they should be the same, right? What I'd like to see is them having the same uh, transform, uh, if that makes sense. So let's go ahead and do that. I lost my place because I accidentally hit the F10 key. All right, uh, so what I want to do is just come over here uh, and take a look at that transform. Uh, and now we'll cut and paste it and put it in here. Oops, it's not what I wanted. Uh, so let's take a look. Uh, they're both set to upright. Uh, the offset P is just a different X, Y, but otherwise the Z is the same. Uh, the scale is the same, manual sort, all this stuff. So again, it, it sure looks like it's sending the same data down to me, right? I mean, that that's looking basically the same. Um, yeah, so I don't really see, I don't see where the difference comes in there. Um, now one thing that I guess I don't know is when these things get rendered, uh, what have they set up for a clip region? I guess that I don't know, uh, because I don't know if the clip region ever specifies anything more complicated. I don't think it does, uh, at least not for our purposes. And it should be always using the same one, uh, for the entirety of the, uh, uh of the game, the actual game graphics at the moment. Ooh, so yeah. That looks the same to me, unless I'm missing something. Um, now, I guess one thing that's slightly odd is the X and the Y are not in the transform in this case. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how much that would matter. I, I don't expect that it would but you know we could imagine temporarily that it did for some reason 
Uh, and if that was the case, uh, then you know we would be able to eliminate the bug in the following way. And so I guess I'm going to do that and we'll see. Uh, instead of having the p-values come in this way, uh, what I would do is set these to zero, or I guess actually that's not what I would do. I would um, set the transforms offset p equal to p, and then I'd set p to zero. So now all of the information is coming through in the offset itself, if that makes sense. Um, and, uh, you know, we can see whether that has any effect. I should make sure, did that actually, yeah, that built, okay. Um, and so we'll see if that has any uh, bearing on it whatsoever. I don't know if it will or if it won't. What happened there? Why did that not do anything? Why am I not getting any displacement via offset P? Does somebody know want to tell me? Because the P value should be the P that we get past plus the offset P. So if I pass in uh, the transforms offset P there, I should, it should transform by that, uh, by that offset value, right? I mean, that should be what what happens there. So I'm not sure why we wouldn't uh, why we wouldn't see essentially the same results, right? Um, not sure why we still have a W in here. Uh, so that's a little odd. Because um, I'm not crazy, right? It says right here that we're doing the two P's plus each other. Uh, so let me take a look at the offset P here. And, yeah. Uh, so if we do the two P's plus each other, in theory, we should still be getting um, that displacement. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, except, of course, we have to always remember to still keep that displacement. <laughs> um, right. Because uh, we've got an incoming displacement for the camera offset. Uh, so obviously we need, yeah, that was good. Nice work. Nice work, Casey. Good job. Great job. Um, so yeah, the transform it comes in with the camera's offset, and then we've got our particles offset. We want to add those together. Shove that in the offset P. That's actually what I should have been doing, and now I am. Uh, so this should be more correct. Let's see. Uh, and we got to, of course, slow it down here. Let's slow it down and take a look. Same thing. So now we like we know we're passing the same information, but we're getting for some reason this weird sinusoidal inf uh, behavior. I do not understand why that is happening. That is a real stumper. So I guess one other thing to do here would be to not have the particles go anywhere and see if that does anything. Um, that would basically be something of the form, you know, uh, don't update the position or the velocity ever under any circumstances. You can update the color if you want to. Um, 
And so now when I go through and do these, they'll should just they'll just stay where they are, right? Eventually they'll fade out, but they'll just they'll just stay in one place. Uh, and so when I slide to the side, all I'm going to see is just where they move because they're not moving of their own accord at all, and they've only been at their initial locations, right? So that is just fascinating, right? Look at how those are moving. Did you see that? These are particles that are not moving in any way, as far as we know. And they sort of crank downward. Uh, I'll, I'll put back in the frame-to-frame the -frame displacement, um, because obviously it's a little hard to watch when the thing is kind of uh, jitter like that. So I'll, I'll leave that in there. Um, but man, is that crazy, right? I mean, tell me that wasn't crazy. Uh, there we go. Like, look at that. They like, they go in a circle. So there's basically like a cosine, they are going in like a 360 degree, like cosine sine circle, right? So the camera offset and the camera offset alone is causing them to rotate around something. I don't know what. And that is just, just absolutely fascinating. So I guess working backwards from that, I would say that, you know, we must be looking at uh, something that has to do with the moment arm, like the rotational construction of these guys. Um, you know what else I should do? I would like to verify, now I think about it, that this happens on both render paths. So what's, what happens if I go over here and I set the frame rate all the way, I'm mean, not the frame rate, the update rate very, very low. Uh, and then I switch to software rendering. So now we're software rendering. And now I like slide my dude slowly to the side. And of course, I would probably should have built in release. In fact, you know what? I will build in release mode. We don't want our, it to take forever. Okay. Uh, so let's build in, oops, build in release mode. Almost spilled my tea, man. What? What just happened there? I missed that. Do we have a, a release mode uh, bug here? Oh, are we unaligned? What's going on there? Give me something to work with here, friend. What was my uh, crash type? Access violation reading null. Uh, okay. Who is telling you to read null? Uh, obviously it's a dash, so that means system particles plus particle index uh, is somehow equal to null. Uh, is system known? Can I inspect system at all? Uh, my particles is definitely not null. Uh, so what, what are you talking about there, big guy? Show me the disassembly.
so what are we looking at here? R15, so so that must be a, an actually, I'm guessing this is just an unaligned move or something because there's no way that that's actually a, a zero access because if this is the address that it's trying to read, right? Um, well, that memory address is clearly not zero, right? Um, So assuming we're trying to go from there, what is at that memory address, by the way? Uh, let's see here. Uh, R15 minus OBH. Oh, well, okay, so it actually is zero, though. This is quite peculiar. So what are you trying to do here, Mr. Mr. Compiler? Uh, so you're rerouting, okay, so you take frame displacement and you replicated it out, I assume. Um, yeah, uh, and Unsurprisingly, R15 is the register that's holding the pointer to system. Uh, oh, no, not quite. It's holding the pointer to what exactly? Maybe stack frame of some kind? I'm not sure. So let's take a look here. Uh, R15 is 10C. What, what are my main variables here? Entropy, DT, Okay, so that's a register. Um, frame displacement init. It's the render group. So B8. All right, so I'm gonna look at the memory here. And that's just a giant wash of nothing. So it looks to me like if it's trying to load out of there, I feel like it's probably trying to load that that would be the system particles array. You would think. It's just... eighteen. let's find out. So let's take that and subtract it from this and see where it uh, I can't quite load that, can I? Come on. I want I want to be able to get that pointer. There it is. Can I act? No, I can't. I want to get that value, please. Oh, Visual Studio, you make debugging such a joy. Um, I just wanted to see where we were in here. Um, I want to see where, where we were. So if they're both 10, 17. This one's 18. This one's C8. So I guess I'll just do it in my head. It does. It's not particularly hard, right? Uh, it's just C8 minus 1, 8. Actually, I don't even need to do it in my head. I can just have the, the expression going to do it for me. Uh, so we're that far in. And that far in seems like something you should be able to load. So I'm guessing, I don't know what we've got here. I don't know why it can't load that. It doesn't really make any sense to me. I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. And I don't understand why this would be um, an unaligned load, because if you were loading it, oh, well, but yes, I do. So I think this is just unaligned load. I think that's what the problem is. Um, so what I've got to do, yeah, that's all it is. All right, so I don't know if you guys followed that ridiculousness, 
Um, but basically, I'll just go over it again. I'm pretty sure it's what I said it was originally, but I just wanted to make sure, and I'm not the best at assembly, uh, so, you know, it takes me a little while to, like, make sure I, I only read it in these exact circumstances when I'm like, I've got to figure out what's actually happening. Um, so you can see that it gave me an access violation reading location zero error here. Uh, and so that would imply that I was like accessing memory that I wasn't supposed to access, right? Like I was reading off of a null pointer or something. But inspecting the assembly, it was pretty clear that that was not really what was going on as far as I could tell. And so um, what I actually thought was happening is that because uh, this is um, SIMD code here, uh, that probably what was going on is that it was an unaligned load. Uh, and what happens is if you have a SIMD instruction that expects to be aligned to a 16-byte boundary and it's not aligned to a 16-byte boundary, and we've talked about all this stuff on Handmade Hero before, so if you don't know what I'm talking about, I would encourage you to go back, <laughs> go back and start earlier because that is all covered. Um, it, we, we need our, our um, SIMD lows to be aligned. And what happens is you can see that we've got um, our particles for our particle system uh, are aligned here. Uh, potentially, but when we allocate this particle cache, it's not necessarily going to be aligned unless we force it to be aligned. And what you'll notice is we get the particle cache um, from uh, in handmade world group, world mode rather. Uh, and what you can see here is I tell it to do no clear, but I don't give it an alignment, which means that it's not necessarily going to be aligned to a 16 byte boundary. Our default alignment in Handmade Hero, when we allocate things, uh, we only try to pad them out to a four byte boundary uh, in, our, in, our, um, in our allocator, right? In our memory arena. Uh, and I think, what's that in here? Yeah. Uh, so if you take a look at what's gonna happen there, um, align no clear is probably more what we want. So we can say, hey, uh, we need to align this to a 16-byte boundary because there's stuff in here that needs to be loaded uh, at, at alignment so you can't go fussing with it. I think that would probably fix it, and I'm right. All right. Um, so let's go over here. Uh, let's slow the simulation down again. Uh, we'll switch to the software render, and again, I just wanted to make sure that this was the same in both renderers, because then that also tells me that it's not something about like how we're interfacing to say OpenGL or something like this. So here is our software render we've switched to. Um, so now not using the graphics card at all, and let's see what happens when I move. Okay, so you can see them, they're still undergoing that corkscrew motion. Uh, so this is good because this basically tells us exactly what we need to know. It has nothing to do with the render layer and below. It's at the sort of upper level of the renderer when we're actually specifying these particles uh, that things are going uh, bonkers, right? Okay. Uh, so if I now go into um, handmade render group, what I want to do here is I would like to sort of get some reacquaintance because we don't have looked at this in a while. At what happens when we actually send down one of these bitmaps, right? Uh, when I do a, a push bitmap call, I just want to see what I what I get here. So you can see that I'm I'm I've got an x-axis and a y-axis. The x-axis and the y-axis get sent down here as part of the push bitmap call. Um, so presumably they're just getting set to like one and zero, and they're getting multiplied by the scale values that come out here. Um, uh, which is the whatever size we've given the thing uh, plus plus the scale value, right? Uh, so since we don't see the bitmap rotating at all, I figure that can't really be part of it. I mean, if the X and Y axes were moving at all there, we would see that. Uh, and I can't really see, like, you know, when we are passing, uh, I guess let's see what get bitmap dim does. So 
so in this case we are passing through this this dim p uh so yeah you can see there's a little bit of funny business going on here right we use the alignment point like the hot spot basically of um whatever the thing is that we're passing down and that's actually the thing that gets transformed right so the alignment itself uh sort of says where the point is that the bitmap would be centered around. Um, I don't know immediately why that would be uh, anything to be concerned about at the moment, but it's just something to keep in mind there. Uh, and you can kind of see we pass this, uh, the C align value down, that's what controls these. So, you know, if it was the alignment that was doing it, well, that kind of gives us though one way to take that out of the equation as well, which might be good, uh, which is to say, when we go ahead and render one of these bitmaps, if we call push bitmap, um, push bitmap, uh, and we pass like the offset and the color, uh, I could then pass zero zero for the alignment, um, and hopefully that would give me. Oops, what did I do? Oop, accidentally edited that. I did not mean to. Um, I should be able to take that out uh, and I should be able to see if the alignment has anything to do with it either. I'm assuming it doesn't, but again, obviously my assumptions don't mean anything because anytime you're uh, in a situation like this, which you know doesn't happen very often, uh, where you're finding looking for a bug, you have no idea what it is, uh, your assumptions are obviously wrong or you would know where the bug was, right? So that to me looks like that really doesn't change matters at all. Uh, so I don't think that's, uh, oops. Uh, so I don't think that's implicated. So I'm not sure what that leaves us with. Changing the camera offset causes a corkscrew motion. I mean, if we had rotation matrices or anything like that in here, I could see it being related, but I really just don't know where that would be. So I'm gonna look to see where we do any trig at all. Um, So this is all code that's not even used, right? This was when we were playing around with some lighting stuff and weird things like that. Um, ARM2 is there, but that's about it. Uh, that's not used. So if I do a look for ARM2, ARM2 is used pretty much only in angle offset movement mode, uh, which these are particles, they're not going through that. So I don't even know where we could generate motion of that form. Because if we're not inputting any kind of circular operation, I'm not sure how we even get anything like that to happen. This is a brain buster. This may be the weirdest bug I think we've ever seen on Handmade Hero. I have absolutely no idea, because if you asked me, generate a circular motion without using sine and cosine, I think I'd be at a loss. I mean, I suppose I could try to, I mean, I don't know, like, Pretty much everything I know how to do that involves rotation is going to have to take a sine and a cosine at some point. So I guess, I mean, the answer is that must not be really a circular motion. It's got to be some other motion that just kind of looks vaguely circular. Um, which I guess is fine. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's pretty confusing. Um...
So it's definitely not circular, I guess that's what I'd say. I guess I will open it up. Uh, to the Q&A for now, because while I'm just thinking of random things to do, if anyone wants to ask a question. Uh, Neil says, look at the screen border while you're doing it. Yeah, does the screen border do a similar thing? Oh yeah, you're totally right. So basically everything transformed by that world transform has this happen to it. But for some reason the entities don't. Entities get displaced by the modified camera P during room transitions, I think. Uh, yeah, but aren't we also doing that? I guess we must not be doing that correctly. Uh, and yeah, so if it's just that, then that would make sense because it is a, a little like parabola thing, which is sort of rot looks a little rotation-y. Uh, someone suggested, and I think this is a very good suggestion. Who suggested it? The Sizek said, what if you try, uh, no, not sorry. Um, Cyberpunk Hobo said, what if you disable the parabolic camera transition between rooms? I think that is a good idea. Um, because assuming that that is what's, if that is what's sort of instigating it, then we could at least guarantee that, that it is that Z motion that's instigating it um, by turning it off. Uh, because if we turn it off and it stops happening, then we know that's the case. If it's still happening, then we know that it's not that, which is a good clue, right? Doesn't quite tell us what's wrong, but it is a good clue. Uh, so here we have the world mode camera offset thing with the room delta stuff. Uh, I think what we could probably do is just say like, okay, you know, world mode camera offset um, uh, dot z equals zero zero, and then from there we know that we've zeroed out that particular piece of of information. So now when I go across uh, the rooms. It should just be a straight, you know, straight pan. So hopefully now we will see that behavior stop so we can know at least that it is based on the Z movement of the camera. Um, yeah, and that looks nice and solid, okay. Uh, so at least we know it's based on the Z movement of the camera. Uh, and so the question is just if the Z move motion of the camera uh, is what's causing that to occur. Why is it that we're seemingly not applying that camera rotation the same uh, for the entities as we are uh, for everything else? And I don't know why. Uh, I guess it's just a, a slip of the, of the fingers. But yeah, you can kind of see that happening there. 
Um, so when we look at the entities, uh, we pass the camera P down into the entities, right? Um, and I don't think we really do much else with it. So I mean, get entity ground point minus camera p should be the same as sticking that into the uh, transform. Are we putting it in backwards or something? Let's find out. So, yeah, I mean, this looks like the same transform, right? It's just subtracting camera P. That's all it does. Uh, so it should be the same as it is in here, unless, does anything happen to camera P um, along the way? Doesn't look like it. Does anything happen to world transform? No. So, I mean, it, it seems like it's the same uh, exact operation. Right? I mean, that is... That is exactly it. If the camera offset Z, I mean, so I guess similarly speaking, right? If I were to take camera P here and set the Z to zero, I would also expect uh, none of that behavior to occur, right? So what's interesting about that is the camera P even if I zero out the Z motion so is it actually Y motion that's rel related here? This is quite creepy. So camera 
mode world mode camera offset is that used elsewhere uh, there is the places where we set it cutscene don't matter ah I see I see said the blind man we are using that in here to set the floor height and we shouldn't be presumably we should be using this Oh boy. Well, yeah. I guess we kind of deserve that with how much tinkering we've been doing with, like, sort of weird 2D rendering of 3D stuff in a kind of ad hoc way. That's, uh, you know. It's to be expected, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of really nasty. Um, I mean, basically what that implies to me, uh, yeah, is again, we, we really have to be more rigorous about these sorts of things, which of course is very difficult because we don't really know what the right answer is for a lot of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so first thing is first, uh, you should use camera P for uh, the entities because that's what we actually get, we're, we're passing in there, right? Um, so we wanna do that first. And now what we have to do is for the particles, we would have to do the same operation. So basically, when we compute the floor height, we've got to take uh, that world mode camera offset into account. Uh, so yeah. So you know, if we want to do the particles the same way, then what we'd have to do is say, okay, uh, we're not gonna we're gonna uh, pass in the camera p here. Uh, instead of the transform, uh, the camera P comes in this way. When we create uh, our transform, we actually create a default transform. Uh, and uh, we take in here the camera P. Uh, then what happens is when we come through this piece of code here, uh, then what we need to do is when we are uh, computing the the floor height there, right? Um, we need to say like, okay, so first of all, the you know the transform offset p uh, equals uh, negative camera p, uh, and then also like the floor z has to have this uh, entity bit baked into it. Where is that at? Here it is. Right, which is kind of absurd and definitely not gonna last. Uh, we're gonna have to fix that. Uh, but I believe that is more like what we would need to do to make sure these things render the same because hey, they've got to actually render the same. Um, hold on a second. Uh, slow down. Get back over here. Okay. Dude. Hey, look. Uh, it sort of worked. Still got some movement there, though. I think probably because those guys are actually at different Zs. That looks like actual motion I would expect at higher Z values, potentially. Uh, so that may be a little more understandable, but we'll see. We're definitely not getting any more of the parabola displacement though, which is what I would expect to see now, so that's good. All right, so a little closer. 
Uh, and what was the other thing that I what was the other thing that I had turned off there? Uh, I think I did. I think I turned it back on, right? In sim region, I don't have that up, uh, turned off anymore. Yeah, I don't. Uh, and what about world mode? I don't zero anything out anymore, do I? No. All right, so a little bit better, not fantastic still, but a little bit better. Um, And yeah, I believe that that uh, I basically think that uh, for two D, you know, you there's a lot of things that are a lot simpler in two D, right? Um, but there's a few that are vastly more complex, you know, and uh, a lot of it is this way. Uh, it's basically like because you don't have a uniform idea of where everything is you end up with all of these kind of hacks and you know we'll get them more under control as we go further down handmade hero we can crank this down a little tighter and get these hacks to be more straightforward um so you know it's not as bad as it seems right now because we're still in the process of hammering out some of these finer details and we're trying to do you know more stuff than we should you know i mean we're we're you know, we don't have to do a lot of these things that we're doing. Uh, we can just ignore these problems and not have some of these uh, features, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, when you do 3D, the nice part about that is you know ahead of time because you sort of already have a systemized way of representing everything. You don't have to come up with that stuff yourself. So you don't have to go through the hacky phase of like figuring things out because you're just like, oh, if I just actually do the 3D math, everything gets placed properly and we're all good, right? But, um, you know, you will quickly get into all those hacks in 3D as well. Because as soon as, you know, yes, it takes care of all your spatialization for you, but then uh, transparency doesn't work properly anymore. And you can't um, do lighting at all. So all your lighting stuff now has to be crazy hacked weird stuff. Uh, and now you've got a whole asset pipeline thing of how do you get like mesh data in and texturing and all these other sorts of things. So there's tons more complexity that does come in. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that 3D games uh, are ever going to be less complicated, but there are definitely parts of the pipeline that just get a lot simpler in 3D, not because there's something magically simpler about it, but rather because we've worked it out so well at this point that you just don't have to do the work, right? It's like if I want to set up a 3D scene, I just know how to do it now because we've had so much experience doing that and we've got it down to a science, right? Um, whereas 2D games is not quite that way. There is no science of 2D games because since it's an approximation, there isn't one uniform way that's just we can just teach that's like, oh yeah, no matter what the 2D game is, here's how you would architect the spatialization of it. You can't do that because it's always sort of a, a hack and which hack you need to pick is gonna be specific to the game. And so that's really the problem with the 2D-ness of it is, is that. But again, we'll be able to systematize this stuff as we push a little bit harder on it. We'll get it down to something cleaner. It won't be as ugly as it is now. Um, so the only reason that 3D kind of appears cleaner in that sense is because we've already determined a set of stuff that works and you don't have to guess what it's going to be. So it's kind of clean from the start in that fundamental way. What is the difference between Handmade Hero and 1935? Uh, they're 
different in pretty much every way you could imagine. I don't know. They're completely different. Um, I guess I would say. So just now the fix only applied to the particles because the borders are still moving. Uh, yes, that's correct. The borders are using that transform and that transform doesn't do the floor thing. It's basically because of that floor hack we did where we wanted to transform floors at different heights. Uh, Neil, in the code, I think they mean, oh. Um, well, I guess I would say the handmade hero code uh, sort of has two, uh, I guess I would say two main, uh, well, let's say three main deficiencies compared to say the 1935 code base. So number one is I have to program handmade hero in a way that's one hour a night and it makes it very difficult for me to keep the code as clean as I would like it to be from my perspective. Because one of the things that often will happen is I'll go through these periods of reorganization and a lot of stuff that I can't do very effectively in an hour because I kind of have to keep everything in my brain and, and, and play around with how it slots out and stuff like that. So um, things in 1935, uh, uh, tend to achieve much higher levels of quality because of the time I can devote to it and the blocks of time, right? So it's both the duration of coding at a time, but also just Handmade Hero is never going to be a game. I mean, the number of hours spent on the 1935 code base is so far above however, how many we'll ever be able to spend on Handmade Hero, right? There's really nothing you can do about that. Um, so, you know, it's, it's necessarily less refined because there is no way to achieve that level of refinement um, with the constraints of Handmade Hero. So that's just how that is, right? Um, number two is that uh, I can't be too advanced on Handmade Hero, right? Uh, like, I have to keep things in a relatively... Um, comfortable zone both in terms of people's ability to understand what i'm doing and why i'm doing it on stream uh and also my ability to code it while talking right uh and so the very most sophisticated stuff is just not going to be happening on handmade hero because it's not like possible to do that um and then third is there's no tooling or, uh, or environment stuff on Handmade Hero. So I don't, for example, have a metaprogramming layer. Um, I don't have a, like a virtualized platform layer and stuff like this. So certain things I have on 935 that I've written um, that were sort of separate projects that reinforce uh, and are used to develop the main project, uh, those do not exist on Handmade Hero. So the code cannot take advantage of any of that, um, whereas on 1935 it can. So I'd say that there's probably like, uh, you know, those, those three main differences in terms of the code make it so that there's, there's quite a bit of difference between the two code bases. My approach to the programming though is pretty much always the same. Like I approach the code on Handmade Hero the same way I approach on 1935. Um, the only difference is I'm able to do a better job on 1935 than I am on Handmade Hero. So the quality of the code differs fairly drastically perhaps, but the approach doesn't. And so you just have to imagine kind of, okay, you see how my program, imagine if I had, you know, um, 10, uh, 10x the hours, um, where would this code have been in this time period, right? You know, going over the same uh, code. And, you know, hopefully you can imagine that it would be much, much better because there would just be all of this uh, additional engineering that could go into it and it, it, you know, it would get proportionally better. Um, are we able to change the projection in this game? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. I mean, it's a, it's a 2D game that the art assets are 2D. So you can only um, change, like, the way they're scaled really you can't rotate them in the third dimension because there isn't any like data there to see in update and render entities 
Uh, is the movement mode angle attack swipe case missing a break or is the fall through intentional? Fall through is intentional if I remember correctly. How far would you say you are at developing this game? How many episodes can we still expect? Uh, I was ballparking 600, so we're like halfway there. But I mean, I don't know. That was just a very random ballpark. I'd say it's not too out of the question um, because, you know, we're sort of getting to the point where the engine's pretty good. Uh, there's still some pretty rough parts to it, so we're kind of, we're kind of trying to work those out now. Um, but, you know, I would say maybe, you know, so we're off 700, 800 episodes if we're off by a bit. Um, uh, but I don't know. It depends on how much gameplay we put in, certainly. It's a little bit scalable because we don't have, you know, I, I had goals of wanting to cover, like, all the basic game engine stuff, showing some of that in all the cases. And so, you know, I, that I want to have in there. But in terms of what we put in for gameplay, I, I don't care as much because, you know, Gameplay is a, more of a game design uh, thing, and it doesn't, um, you know, it, it, that that's not what this stream was about. So I, I don't really care what we do as long as the I've shown enough gameplay programming so that everyone understands what how it how that sort of code works and how to architect it or how to like play around with architectures for it. That's really the only part that I care about there. Do you find it difficult to connect switch between 935 and Handmade Hero? And if so, has it gotten easier with time? Um, so, uh, I would say, like, I, I, do f I do find that I wish I could control more when I switch and when I don't. Uh, there's sometimes on 9 turn 35 that I would have liked to have just been thinking about it for several days at a time and not have had to go do a handmade hero. Um, so there will probably be a time at some point, I don't know when, where I'll probably take handmade hero off the air for three or four months when we are f finaling 1935 uh, because I, uh, you know, handmade hero as nice as it is, doesn't pay the bills, right? So uh, I have to make sure 1935 ships and ships well. Um, so at some point, I'll probably have to put Hammy Hero on delay for a little bit. And then when I come back from that, uh, you know, we'll finish Handmade Hero up. I may even do an accelerated schedule at that point because I may, like, then switch to Handmade Hero full-time for a while, maybe do, like, a couple episodes a day or something like that um, to finish it up. I don't know. Uh, but basically, like... Uh, it, it definitely is the case that being able to concentrate on a single code base for a while is is better. Uh, and certainly in the future, I, w I wouldn't do another Handmade Hero, um, probably. I, I really want to do it, and so I'm glad I did, but it definitely is taxing in terms of the mental shift. And uh, it's not like it's not possible to, to program two code bases at once, but you do take a little bit of a hit. And... Uh, I don't really want to always take a little bit of a hit, you know, I would rather, um, uh, you know, I, I would rather concentrate on one or the other. And furthermore, you know, if I did do it where I like switched to program Handmade Hero uh, more full-timey for a little while, that would also allow me to maybe make a little bit better code on stream because I could do back-to-back -back a few episodes doing something that would take longer than an hour and they would kind of my mental state would be the same throughout them so I could kind of like make sure that I kept everything in my brain properly and didn't forget anything all right uh, I have a lot of work to do so I am gonna go back and end the stream. Uh, all right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you, as always. If you would like to follow along at home, you can always pre-order the game on handmadehero.org. Uh, we have a, um, a handy and a pre-order button for that. We also have a forum site. You can go to if you want to ask questions. A Patreon page you can go to uh, support the video series. A schedule bot you can use uh, to know when we're going to be live. And an episode guide if you would like to... Catch up on old stuff. Um, that's about it for today. I'll be back here tomorrow, same time, same place. 
Uh, last stream of the week, is it Friday? It is. Uh, for the last stream of the week, um, and uh, until then, have fun programming, everyone, and I'll see you on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.